Good morning, everybody. It is so wonderful to see this room packed nice and early this morning. And um, particularly for me, Richard, it's wonderful to see you. And I never dreamed that after knowing you for maybe, what, 25 years, as I have, uh, that we would be sitting here discussing this topic. And after you have written this wonderful, riveting book. And I hope each one of you will take away today something new, something that will surprise you, because I think they will. Now, as many of you may know, as many of you may not know, Richard Sandler was childhood friends with Michael Milken. And he also became unexpectedly his personal attorney during the terrible years of trial that Mike went through in the 1980s. There are so many details there, and a lot of them we remember. But when I think back personally on those years, not having a wit of knowledge about anything but show business, that was what I did. But hearing about this, it was quite a big scandal. And Michael Milken was painted out to be a terrible demon. So I want to start with this, Richard. You literally, you and Lowell Milken, Mike, Michael's younger brother, were, you met when you were six years old, so Mike was eight. That is correct. And, and that became a very close friendship starting from day one. Yeah, it's been a very unusual relationship. But first, again, also thank you all for being here. And Mary, thank you for doing this. As I told My you before pleasure. we came on, it's such an honor for me to be sitting there and having Mary Hart interviewing me, especially since I've admired you for so many years, and we've had such a really important friendship these last 20 thank years, you. so thank you. Um, you know, it's an unusual relationship in that I know a lot of people, a lot of you out there, I'm sure have childhood friends that you still are in contact with. Um, but Lowell and I met in the first grade, we were six years old, and we became like best friends almost immediately. We went all the way through school together. We were in public schools. Uh, we went to Berkeley together. We went to UCLA Law School together. Uh, Lowell actually introduced me to my wife, Ellen, when we were in college. And um, we worked across the street from each other. Our families got to know each other. We traveled, took vacations together. And for the last 30 years, well, actually, actually I actually shouldn't say that, 40 years, which is only 30, uh, <laughs> we've been working together. So it's, I don't know anybody that's had relations like that where you actually have been interacting with the person almost on a daily basis for 69 years now. And that all started out beautifully. You were in business together. Michael had come out of Berkeley and he had joined Drexel. And I, I actually want, um, I want you to tell us why Drexel was Mike's choice, why that was the perfect fit at that time in the late 70s. Okay, so Michael went to Berkeley, then he went to Wharton, um, did very well, is not surprising anybody that knows him and really had a lot of choices. The reason he went to Drexel is Drexel was the top research firm on Wall Street. So at the time, most firms on Wall Street would look at their salesmen as the most important part of the firm because they're the ones that produce the revenue. He inverted it. He felt the research was the most important foundation for anything you were doing in investing. If you were investing, you were cutting your risk by the information you knew. You had information by research. So he went to Drexel because of its research capabilities. And at the age of 24, 25 years old, he was actually head of research at Drexel Burnham. And that was important, um, Richard, because as weird as it sounds, and that's what Drexel specialized in, knowing the companies that you want to help prosper and provide money for. But Mike's idea was, was so different. And yet they actually believed that this kid has something to offer us. So Drexel was, they were behind him. And they invested in a lot of companies early on. Correct. They were responsible for the growth. So can you give us an idea of a few of those companies in the beginning? OK, so Mike had an idea when he got to Wall Street that Wall Street um, is a place where you could actually make a difference in society that people had meaningful lives if they had meaningful jobs. People had meaningful jobs if they worked for companies that had adequate capital and had good ideas. When he was at Berkeley, he read a book that somebody had looked at what is called, and I'll give a real quick course uh, in, in finance and high yield securities, of 
what was called high yield securities. Now, what does that mean? Every company that issues debt is, has the debt rated by one of the rating firms, usually Standard & Poor's or Moody's. If it's rated below a certain level, triple B, it's considered high yield, not investment grade. If it's above that, it's investment grade. At that time, almost all non-investment grade debt was debt issued by companies that were investment grade when they issued the debt. But then they got in trouble. They stopped making payments, they stopped doing things, the ratings went down and the price of their bonds in the market would go down because people were concerned they wouldn't get their interest paid or their principal paid. The study that Mike looked at when he was at Berkeley showed that the number of companies that defaulted were much less than the decrease in price of the securities would have suggested. So that if you bought every single high yield security that had ever been issued, over time, you would make money because fewer would default and more would pay off. So he decided that he wanted to invest in this area and the best way to invest was to do research, understand the companies, understand the management, understand the industry. And he felt by having a portfolio of high yield securities, you would do much better than buying investment grade securities or even stocks. Stocks are emotional, okay? You like a company, no one else likes it, it will sell at a very low PE. And I'm really careful what I'm saying because Reed Harmon, who worked at Drexel for many years, is sitting there, and I don't want him to be competing <laughs> me later. Uh, so, um, so, but if you like a bond and no one else likes it, it might be selling at 50 cents on the dollar. If it's paying 10% interest and it's selling 50 cents on the dollar, you're actually getting 20% interest because you're getting interest on 100 cents. If you're correct and everybody else is wrong, it's a contract. The company will pay your interest when interest comes due in principal. And the companies that Mike invested in and he got money from Drexel to invest in these companies did very, very well. And therefore, he started growing his company and the idea came probably in the late 70s, why don't we do original issues of non-investment grade companies? That was not being done at the time on Wall Street. So they did original issue of non-investment grade companies. Some of the companies you might have heard of are that they, uh, that they finance would be companies such as McCaw Cellular, T uh, Ted Turner, okay, Steve Wynn in Las Vegas, others in Las Vegas, Time Warner. So they did a lot of these companies that couldn't get financing traditionally in the markets, all of a sudden they opened up a market. And, and when you think of that list of companies, they have revolutionized our world today. Without Mike Milken and his unique idea, where would they have been? Where would Ted Turner, CNN, TBS, where, where would they have been? Macaw Cellular. When I think about this, and you know, and I have been, I, I've been no student of law, but I never understood, and I would like to know, first of all, who coined the term junk bonds? Well, I think it became, as Drexel became more and more successful, the rest of the street that wasn't in this industry was not getting the revenue from the industry. They couldn't compete in the industry. Some of the people Drexel was financing, if they thought that there was an established company that was undervalued and they could get financing from Drexel to try to acquire that company, that upset traditional Wall Street and those companies that they weren't. So they looked at the high yield securities as being kind of you know, beneath them. Okay, this is an area we don't, why would anybody be in this area? These are a bunch of companies that are traditionally, they used to call them fallen angels, uh, since there's so many angels in this room. Um, <laughs> they used to call them the fallen angels because they were companies that were highly uh, rated and then they lost their rating. So they just started calling them junk bonds. Okay, oh, you're just buying a bunch of junk. But the greatest value that was being created at that time was being created by the companies issuing these high yield securities. In fact, in the 1980s, over 100% of all job creation came from companies that could not get investment grade. Which is remarkable. And that comes into the trial too. And, and what you point out is that the bottom line, there were tens, hundreds of millions of people who were employed because of the success of this revolutionary idea in finance that they called junk bonds. 
And um, now, now we'll call it high yield because Thank that you. is much more dignified as it should be. Um, there, there is much to talk about in those early years. And just one point that I was inspiring for me to read about how Mike came about this idea was the, the, um, the 1968 riots in Los Angeles where there was so much destruction in the community by members of the community. They destroyed their own businesses. It was a horrifying time. And that made a big difference. Yeah, in fact, Mike actually was visiting with somebody down in that area and ran into somebody who was bragging about the fact that they were responsible for building down this building. And he found out that person used to work in that building. And he said to himself, wait a minute, the guy burned down the building that he worked in. Where's he going to work tomorrow? And it just gave him this idea that he often, Mike often, often says that the good investment, the good financier is a social scientist, okay? Because you're creating growth, you're creating entrepreneurship, you're creating job creation in the world. And by going to Wall Street, he would make sure that people had the money they needed to grow businesses. And in the case of the Watts riots, the people that owned that building, the reason this person was proud, were not the people that lived there. And he thought the idea is, if I can get money to people that otherwise couldn't get money, they could build businesses. They could build businesses in their own neighborhoods as well as other neighborhoods. You know, and this would be great for society. And history has proven that to be correct. Yeah. OK, so cut to the business is growing. Everybody's doing well. Drexel, Burnham, Lambert. Is, is doing very well, and there, there are a couple of characters in there, Ivan Bosky being probably the main character, um, but not, not necessarily the only culprit at that time. Tell us about the day in 1986, I think it was November 14th, that you learned about the news and what it meant to you. Because at this time, you had decided you, didn't want to, you weren't going to practice law anymore. You, you weren't doing that. Well, I, I've been practicing law for 10 years. And in the latter couple of years, I've worked on a number of Drexel transactions mm -hmm. uh, with Mike and Lowell and the people in the department. Uh, they would invest in different things, and they would need a lawyer to to represent them in these transactions, and I was doing a lot of that work. And then they gave me an opportunity. They said, do you want to leave the practice in law? Because we want to put together a group that will oversee our personal investments of the guys in the department. A lot of them were Drexel deals. So you will work with the lawyers. You'll be more of the clients. You'll be our representative. And that's you know, what I did in 1983. November 14th, I remember, because it is uh, my wife sitting here, our son Nicholas's sixth birthday. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon. Now, let's talk about Ivan Bosky for a second. How many people here have ever even heard of Ivan Bosky? Oh, okay, so you're all very, very young. Um, so, <laughs> but Ivan Bosky was the most revered risk arbitrageur of the time. He probably was the largest buyer of equity securities in the market with accounts with every major firm on Wall Street at the time. Uh, he was introduced at Drexel. People at Drexel introduced him to Mike. I think Mike's view was, if this guy is that important in what he's doing, maybe I can get him to be a bond buyer. Maybe we could represent him. In Who knows what can happen? And they had a relationship with Ivan Bosky. About six months earlier than November 1986, um, uh, Wall Street was a little bit shaken by a guy named Dennis Levine, who actually worked at Drexel at the time but had been caught uh, making money on insider trading, trading on uh, confidential inside information, which was illegal. As a, he was a Kidder Peabody at the time, and he was in corporate finance. If he worked on a transaction and he knew company A was buying company B, he's not allowed to buy stock in company B. What he would do is he would put together a group of guys. They'd all changed information. He opened bank accounts, I believe, in the Bahamas and uh, secret accounts, and he would take literally bags of cash down there, deposit in the account, and in a secret account would buy stock in that. And somebody saw something suspicious, it's a whole long story in and of itself, but he got caught and he pled guilty to insider trading. And this began the insider trading scandal, if you want to call it at the time. 
Then on this day in November, uh, with kind of a shock to most people, at 1 o'clock Los Angeles time, is which when the market closes, it came across the tape that Ivan Boski, the number one purchaser of securities at the time, the risk arbitrageur, was made a deal with the SEC and the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York to plead guilty, who also was involved in insider trading. He was going to cooperate, only would have to plead to one count, which was kind of amazing, um, and had to pay a very large fine of $100 million, which was uh, unheard of at that time, it showed how much money he had made. And so Ivan Boski all of a sudden was in the news as having done things illegally. Simultaneously, I get a call from someone downstairs that there are federal marshals downstairs serving subpoenas both from the U.S. Attorney's Office from the Southern District of New York and the SEC on Mike Lowell and others. Simultaneously, the same thing is happening in New York. Our life changed dramatically at that time. You, uh, did you have any idea that you would be implicated in the Boski affair? Not at all, because Look, at, I knew what we did. I knew the individuals. I knew what was happening. I could not even imagine a scenario in which my close friends, myself, people I was associated would come under investigation from the United States of America for doing anything that seriously wrong. Okay, so it started a whole new education, unfortunately for me, uh, and then eventually opened my eyes to how the process works, the power of the government, and the fact that everybody that is implicated isn't necessarily guilty. And Richard, that was also the day that you became Michael's personal attorney for all of these years since, um, and torturous years then. Why Mike? Why was it Mike who became the bullseye in the target of the government I, and the SEC. I think the best way to explain it, and probably the quickest way to explain it, is let me just read one quick passage, okay, from the book. And this is a quote from Arthur Lyman. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, Arthur Lyman was one of the top lawyers in America. He was the lead managing partner at the Paul Weiss firm in New York. Uh, around that time, he actually represented uh, the Senate committee in the Iron Contra matter and represented a lot of people that Mike knew, and Mike knew him, and he became lead lawyer in our case. This is something he wrote in his memoirs. Throughout my career, I've known and represented some powerful figures in the financial industries, but none like him, speaking of Mike. None so modest in how they lived, or for whom money meant so little. None as committed as he was to his own visions and aspirations, an enigmatic figure to me even now. But I think I could say this about him. He was the most imaginative financier of his generation. He was also the least understood and surely the most demonized. Now, in what Mike was doing, he was making a lot of enemies on Wall Street because they weren't participating. And the more they tried to put down what he was doing, the bigger the department got. So jealousy, big time Definitely jealousy. jealousy and and, you know, Mike was media shy. Mike believed in doing his work. He didn't want to get a lot of attention to himself. So as he got more and more known, the media kind of looked at him as reclusive because he wouldn't talk to them. So there's a cover story on Business Week. There's a cover story on Forbes magazine. He would not participate in those stories, okay? So he had all this going on at that time. Um, and when he would do deals, he would also be representing people that would go after major companies. One that always comes to mind is Unical, Union Oil California. Huge company, investment grade company, very powerful CEO of that company with a lot of relationships in the United States Congress, a lot of relationships on Wall Street, and this guy that, rep that, was rep that Drexel financed named Boone Pickens out of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, an oil and gas guy, he thought Unical was not being managed properly and felt that it was undervalued, and he started a hostile takeover. There were other Drexel clients that did the same thing with other companies, creating tremendous value for the shareholders because the companies either had to reorganize or they actually acquired the companies, made enemies. Congress probably had eight or ten bills in front of Congress to outlaw high-yield securities in some fashion. 
certain companies or certain institutions couldn't buy high yield securities. There was even a bill that said that you could not deduct the interest if you were a company issue of high yield securities for tax purposes. None of these bills went through, but all this was happening. So you had what I would call a very attractive target. Then November 14th happens. In, in New York at the time, there was a case, a corruption case, that Rudy Giuliani, who was the um, US attorney for the Southern District of New York, personally tried. It was a New York corruption case. He tried it in New Haven, Connecticut, because the person couldn't get a fair trial in New York because there was so much publicity. And he won the case the same day. The next morning, the headline in the business section was Ivan Bosky pled. Okay? And the sub, you know, maybe on page two, was this other case. It got Rudy Giuliani's attention. We did not know what to do on November 14th, other than we knew we had to find people that knew what we didn't know. And one of the lawyers that we were introduced to was a guy named Edward Bennett Williams. How many people here have heard of Edward Bennett Williams? Okay, so fewer. Edward Bennett Williams, who died unfortunately in 1988, was the top defense lawyer of his time. He was well known in Washington, the Williams Connolly firm, that's his name, is Edward Bennett Williams. Uh, he was the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, he had a lot going on. And he was an amazing individual, one of the most um, really talented people I'd ever met in the legal profession or otherwise. And when we called him, we told him he had these subpoenas and we read it to him. And the subpoena referred to a statute called RICO, Racketeering Influence Corruption Organizations. And this was a statute that was passed by Congress to give prosecutors even greater powers when they went after organized crime. And it was in this subpoena on this investigation. And Ed said to me, I remember that day, like it was yesterday, he said, I can't believe they're using RICO in a case like this, except it doesn't surprise me. Because a US attorney in New York is this guy, Rudolph Giuliani, and he is the biggest piece of political meat I have seen since Thomas Dewey. <laughs> Thomas Dewey, for those that don't know, was also the US attorney for the Southern District of New York went on to become the governor of New York, and came this close to becoming president of the United States when he ran against Harry Truman. Um, so at this point, Mr. Giuliani, the US Attorney's Office for the Tesman District of New York, made this case a very important case. And when Michael Milken's name came up as somebody and Drexel that were getting subpoenas and were under investigation, you had a lot of people that thought this was their chance to either stop what he was doing, what Drexel was doing, but I think Giuliani looked at him as a very attractive target because of all the attention he had got. Unfortunately, he, to most people, he was a mystery man. There's a whole chapter in the book called The Blank Canvas because nobody knew who he was. And the picture of Michael Milken that was painted on that canvas was painted by the media and by the prosecutor and became a caricature of a person that I don't know and have never met. So as you this what, what we're getting now is the basic, the basic course 101 on what happened with high yield bonds and the revolution in the 80s, the arbitra, uh, arbitrageurs, the uh, hostile takeovers. I so appreciate how you wrote that so that it's understandable and it's interesting. And I say that there are many of you who are far more sophisticated in the business world than I am. But I so appreciate that. It's just one element of this book, though. Because it reads to me, Richard, and I, I said that to you, like a suspense thriller as well. Because one thing would happen that was terrible, and then the next thing would happen. And I think it coincides with our world today, too. It really was precedent setting. Because when you look at the power of government, and you look at when the government takes on an individual or an individual company, there's very, very little you can do to fight it ultimately. No matter how big the brain power is on, on the, the, in this case, your side, and the attorneys, um, because if they're determined to get you with somebody who is as motivated as Rudy Giuliani was, and always has been, but um, 
it was a terrible combination. This also reads, and I want you to know because I'm, I've, I've got to look carefully at our time. This, as we were talking earlier, to me, is a beautiful story of friendship and family and, and love. And it wouldn't be the remarkable story it is without your families. And I would like you, Richard, to touch on how overnight your family life changed, the immediate stress and dread and everything that came into play um, on that day. So, so on November 13th, the day before, if I read in the paper that somebody whose name I'd heard of before was under criminal investigation, I would assume there must be something there, okay? I had no idea on that day what the power of the government was or how the system worked. I learned that two things very quickly. Number one, if you come within the government sites, they have tremendous tools available to come after you and break you down regardless of what you did. And number two, when I read something in the newspaper, and I've learned this you know, painfully over the years, hundreds of times over, and I think a lot of people in this room probably will understand what I'm saying. If you read an article in the newspaper about something that you're familiar with, you understand it, and you're familiar with, the chances are almost you know, 99 times out of 100, the article is inaccurate, okay? Even if it's not a negative article, it's still probably inaccurate. Media has a motivation to sell papers, to get the story out, and to get it out fast. If that was true in 1986, you can imagine what it's like today because we did not have iPhones then, we didn't have 24-7, we didn't have instantaneous news service, we did not have social media. So it's a very different situation. So I'm now in a situation of what are we going to do? My initial reaction was, okay, let's gather the facts, let's stay calm, We'll go in, we'll explain what we did, they'll realize you're making a mistake. How naive could you get, <laughs> okay? <laughs> How naive could you get? Um, you understand, when I talked about Dennis Levine and I talked about Ivan Bosky, when you read about their pleas, you had not read any articles about an investigation or anything else that was going on. You read about it when the decision was made. You read about Drexel and Michael Milken and others being under investigation within the first week of November 14th, okay? Mike ended up actually getting indicted in 1989, okay? Two and a half years later, for two and a half years, we were inundated with subpoenas. We were inundated with article after article after article, painting him as the worst thing that has happened, the, the Al Capone of the financial industry. Everything was his fault. Things that he had never done or even thought about were his fault. Arthur Lyman once said they would have blamed Mike for World War II, except he hadn't been born yet, okay? <laughs> and we can laugh today. I didn't laugh when he said it back then. Um, so we started to put together a legal team. We, you know, we were working, we had the SEC, we had the US attorney, um, and we started putting, we had Arthur Lyman's firm and we had our, uh, Ed Williams' firm. Others hired lawyers. We were having joint defense meetings. This literally monopolized my life for the next, well, definitely, well, probably for the next 10 years, okay, maybe even the next 12 years. Uh, I was in New York or Washington almost every single week. I was away from home. Um, when I was home, I think my wife's sitting here, she will tell you I wasn't necessarily always there there uh, when I was home. And, um, and the same thing for Mike. I mean, if it was doing that to me, you can imagine what it was doing to Mike. His wife, Lori, is here, his family. And here's one of the things that I really want people to take away when they read the book, okay? We are human beings. You know, we try to be productive in our lives. We care about our families. At the time, both Mike and I had three kids, okay? Our kids were ranged in age from six years old to 13 years old. Okay, this is taking our time away from them. When prosecutors come after you in these situations, they don't think in terms of they're trying to get you. They're trying to put you in jail. They don't think about what if they're wrong? What if, you know, how this does affect families and life? And so it was, it, we were totally immersed in it. We were dealing with it. Um, 
you know, I think I get too much credit for, you know, I did what anybody I think would do when you saw an injustice, you knew the person, you cared about them, and you also cared about justice, that what could I possibly do to try to help? And it was frustrating. And, and torturous. And I, I don't even know when you set out to write the book that you would realize how, how personal it was. Or was it because you felt the compelling need to tell your personal story, your side of this? I mean, I, know, I, I, I don't know if you gave the manuscript to Mike. I don't know if he's read it. I know that Lori has read it, and I can't, I can't imagine how difficult, because the trial is there. There are transcripts from the trial itself. Um, and I'm, I'm just skipping ahead a little bit here, because part of one of the names that we all know, too, from this time is Judge Kimba Wood, who was assigned to the trial with virtually no experience. In fact, none right. in this area. Right. And, and that, so two questions. Go back to, what was your intent in writing the book? Okay, so I had, I had two intents. One intent was to get the true story out. Here it is, all these years later, and I'm still reading that Michael Milken went to jail for insider trading. Did not happen, okay? Michael Milken never should have gone to jail, period. Never would have been involved in insider trading. It's something he never would have done. Um, that Michael Milken was responsible for this or that or that. And though there has been a lot of positive things over the years, you have Fortune Magazine, it puts him on the cover, it says the man who changed medicine, gets credit for doing that. Um, I'm just tired of seeing the same lies, and Mike is still an historical figure. I don't think he ever wanted to be an historical figure, but he still is. So history should have something written that's accurate by someone that actually was there. So books came out at the time, written by, um, uh, newspaper reporters who had an agenda. Their agenda was to sell books and to show that they were right and the, the more interesting story is the worse Mike was, the more interesting their story. And those books came out and some of them are still being quoted. So I've said for years, I gotta write the book of what really happened. And fortunately I was able to teach a class at Stanford Law School on the subject and the prosecutor, the line prosecutor in the case was gracious enough to come to that class knowing I was writing a book, knowing I was transcribing the class. So a lot of what's in this book is how he views the prosecutorial system, because he was in it and then became a defense lawyer later. Uh, the head of enforcement, the SEC, came to the class. Bill McLucas. Bill McLucas, yes. okay, at the uh, Wilbur Hill firm. So, yes, we had a, if you talk about a perfect storm of everything that can go wrong went wrong, that was what's happening to us. Number one, Ivan Boski got a jet, get out of jail free card by saying he did things with Michael Milken that were hard for anyone to prove he was right or wrong, and he made his deal. He went after other people too, but you had that happen. You had a U.S. attorney who was extremely ambitious. Um, I actually spoke years later to Gary Lynch, who was head at the SEC at the time, who told me that Rudy Giuliani had no interest in the Dennis Levine case. He had no interest in the Boski investigation until that headline. And then all of a sudden he had tremendous interest. Okay, I don't know if people remember this, but a few months after we came under investigation, there were three other people that apparently Boski had impl implicated. A guy named Wigden Tabor and Freeman, three other people from, I think, Kidder and from Goldman Sachs. He had them arrested in their offices, in shackles, taken out in the public to humiliate them and to pressure them to make deals. I remember that image. I think probably a lot of us do. Two of them, two of the two, Wigden and Tabor, never ever were indicted, or excuse me, they indicted and then they dropped the indictment and were never tried for anything. Friedman ended up pleading to one count, for which I think he served two months in prison, of insider trading based upon the fact that somebody called him once and says, a rabbit told me X, Y, and Z, or so, no, a, somebody named, with a nickname Bunny, there's somebody here with a nickname Bunny, uh, someone with a name, you know, Bunny told me that X, Y, and Z transaction was coming. And what he pled to is he responded and said, your Bunny has a good nose. Okay, that's what, so these three people were arrested. I was so thankful that we did not live in New York at the time. 
okay? But that is what was happening at the time. That is the, the way the process was working. And we were living through a time when we realized that, I remember Ed Williams explained this to me, I did not know this at the time. Everybody thinks it's a level playing field. If any of you have ever been sued, you know that when you take a deposition, everybody, all the parties come to the deposition. If you send out interrogatories, everybody gets copies of the interrogatories. Everybody is on a level playing field, not in a criminal prosecution. The U.S. attorney has the grand jury. The person under investigation has nothing. You have no right to subpoena anybody. You have no right to ask anybody anything, or you are running the danger of being indicted for obstruction of justice. U.S. attorney could bring in witnesses in front of a grand jury with their lawyer outside. They can get all the documents they want, and they could say to you very easily, look, it, an XYZ transaction happened a few years ago. I don't know how well you remember it, but we think you were there. We think this happened. Can you help us? If you could help us, we can give you immunity. You could be, you know, you have nothing to worry about. Just tell us the truth. Nothing you say could hurt you, and you could be a witness of ours. If you can't do that, don't do that. But if we let her later find out that you were involved, we're going to indict you, and you may go to prison. And under the RICO statute, you may lose your entire net worth. What's your choice? That's the power that they have, and it is used day in and day out. Over the years, more and more witnesses, people that we worked with, got immunity. Okay? And most of these people are people that they were great salesmen. They're not the people that you would trust with your greatest secrets, okay? Or you would even trust to tell you the truth because they were great salesmen. Um, and the pressure was building. Another element that's really important to this is not only was Mike under investigation and, uh, and eventually indicted, but so was his brother Lowell, okay? Lowell did not like Ivan Bosky. He did not want to interact with him or do business with him, okay? So, so we're talking little brother too, smart, an accomplished businessman, they're in business together, all of you are. But that was a personal element that was very important. Critical. And the U.S. attorney that came to my class, John Carroll, acknowledged to me that in front of the class that by having Lowell under investigation, that gave them more leverage with Michael. It turned out that Mike and Lowell both got indicted. Um, and uh, I still remember today, it, I, I still get a little emotional about it, sitting in that courtroom when they took their plea uh, in front of Judge Wood of not guilty. And I could not believe, I just couldn't even fathom that these two guys that I've known my entire life were in a U.S. courtroom with a case called United States versus having to even make a plea. It just, you know, it was hard to even fathom that this was happening at the time. Um, but when the government starts, they don't like to stop. And, you know, the, there's a lot of here in the book about what a U.S. attorney's job is, as defined both by attorney generals of the United States and the United States Supreme Court. And the job of the U.S. attorney, just everybody knows, U.S. attorney is not like a lawyer in a civil litigation, where, you know, most U.S. US attorneys look at their job, especially in high-profile cases, to win. Their view is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to win. You go hire your lawyer. He'll try to protect you. That's not my job. But that's not true because of all the power they have. So the Supreme Court stated a U.S. attorney represents a sovereign power, okay? As representing the sovereign power, its job is to make sure that justice is done, to make sure that the guilty are punished and the innocent are not. That's their job. It is not to win the case, all right? John Carroll came in the told us that the job of the U.S. attorney that he was trained to do was to win. Higher the profile, the more important is to win, okay? And there's a lot of quotes and stuff in the book, we don't have to get into it today, limited time, um, of him talking about that that is the currency in which he was paid. He doesn't make money, but the currency he's paid is the more the case gets attention, the better he looks by using his tools to win and that most cases go to young, ambitious, not dishonest lawyers who are trying to make a name for themselves, they're trying to get experience, and they believe that, as I had believed on November 13th, that if a file comes to their desk and your name is in that file, you must have done something wrong and it's my job to show what it is. 
And with the law books full of all kinds of different laws, you know, you could find something eventually. So I, I, I'd like to skip right to, to Judge Kimberwood and her appointment there. How did that happen? How could it be that somebody with no experience, given that this is the federal government leading the case against Mike Milken and Drexel and Lowell Milken, um, it, I don't understand. Well, I don't know how the, the, the process works. Cases get assigned randomly to different judges. Judge Wood was a very accomplished antitrust lawyer. She was appointed to the, to the bench in 1988. This investigation started in 1986. And when the indictment came down, the case was assigned to her. Um, and uh, she, at the time, was married to a editor at Times Magazine. She seemed to have a certain amount of media sensitivity. Um, and, but this, this was her first case, and it was the most talked about and the most uh, publicized case in the courthouse. Um, and you know, we went through a real quickly interesting process. When Mike finally decided to plea, so you got to understand, when he decided to plea, the government said, if you plea, we'll drop all charges against your brother, which is unheard of in the Southern District. Once they bring a case, they don't, they don't care what the case is, number one. Number two, Mike's view was, i got to protect my family. They're coming after me. One of the individuals indicted with Mike and Lowell was another guy at Drexel, a young uh, trader named Bruce Newberg, good guy. He was also indicted in another case. When he got indicted twice for basically doing the same thing, we came to the real realization that even if Mike won, the government is so after you, they may indict you again. So he basically said, I'm going to look at this as a business transaction. How do I cut my losses? We made a deal with the U.S. attorney that we would plead. They, they said you have to plead to six things. One has to be uh, insider trading. We said, good, we're not talking. There's not gonna, he's not pleading anything he didn't do. They backed off. But you had to find five things to plead to. Read in the book what he pled to. Tell me whether you actually think, number one, they even violate the law or that they're crim criminal actions, not one of which had ever been the subject of a criminal prosecution before. But if he had to plead to six, the possible sentence becomes very large. Arthur came up with an idea. The U.S. attorney agreed with it. We would stand up at the plea, and when Mike pleaded guilty, and we would state that, Your Honor, the government has agreed that they will not ask for consecutive sentences. So if you plead to six counts, you could serve consecutive sentences up to 28 years. If they're concurrent, that caps it at five years, because concurrent means you'll just serve the highest one. Government stood up as they said they would and said, yes, true, Your Honor, at times we have asked for these other things, but because of the circumstances, we will not be asking for it here. We thought we capped it at five years. Sentence came down, very interesting. So he pled to all these things that nobody had ever heard of before as crimes. And the government filed a sentencing memorandum that said, besides this stuff, he did insider trading. He did, he did manipulation. He did fraud. He did so many other things. I just want you to be aware of it. Judge said, well, wait a minute. He says he didn't do it. You say he did do it. I'm going to hold a hearing called a Fatigo hearing. And if you can prove to me he did anything else, I'll take that into account in sentencing him. So here we were sitting, sit, we're trying to avoid a trial. Now we have a trial. They brought up three. They could pick anything they want. This was up to them. We thought it was an unfair process. They picked three things. They failed on all three things. Okay. The judge later said she doesn't believe the government can prove that he did anything other than what he pled to. This is what the ju judge Wood said this in a public document. But for whatever reason, which gets you get more detail in here, she sentenced him to ten years. And, and that was a complete earth-shattering moment for you. It was devastating. First of all, remember what I said about we had kids certain ages. Yeah. Okay. So it was now three years had gone by. Okay, so the, the, you know, the six-year-olds were nine years old, the 13-year-olds were 16 years old. You're just telling somebody, we thought that 10 years meant you could be gone for six years, that you're going to miss your children's entire rest of their youth. Okay, I mean, this is what U.S. attorneys don't think about. What if they're wrong? All right? And then Judge Wood, within a week, came to, you know, called us back in and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't intend him to serve a sentence of 10 years because he's going to be eligible for parole, you know, in three years. 
and I will work with the parole commission to help you get that number down. Which she ultimately did. Which she ultimately did. Uh, and and we're so we're so almost out of time here. Seconds left. Mike served almost two years in prison. Almost two years because. Um, and it was not the white collar luxurious facility that I think we have been misled about. And I think our time's going to be cut okay, off. Okay, but here. very quickly, Richard, yeah. I want, next time you read about a country club prison, I want you to volunteer to spend a week there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just go over there as an inmate for one week and you see how, how wonderful it, it is. And, but, and I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting here, but life has turned around to the extent that Rudy Giuliani and Mike, in his endless capacity for forgiveness, was able to come to Mike for help and um, with his prostate cancer. And the good that the Milken Institute, Richard, and all of you, has done in this world today is revolutionary and should be lauded.